When a pair of Ivy League mathematicians in 2007 examined the intricate tile work of the medieval Islamic world, they were astounded by what they saw. Here was evidence of sophisticated geometric patterns that were understood in the West only 500 years later. Nonetheless, the researchers could not bring themselves to credit Muslim mathematicians with such a discovery. Instead, they suggested the designers and architects do not truly understand the patterns underlying principles. Now, it might seem tempting to overlook this verdict on the part of two mathematicians, apparently unschooled in the rich history of Islamic science, yet it accords fully with a pattern dating back centuries of willful disregard for the Muslims' intellectual achievements. In this way, the West has successfully guarded its claim on the development and eventual monopoly over the very notion of science. I wrote the House of Wisdom to address the collective amnesia that has left many of us with the unshakable, if deeply misguided, conviction that the world of Islam and that of the West have nothing in common. The book introduces the reader to some of the crowning achievements of Islamic science across fields of astronomy, mathematics, medicine, chemistry, and philosophy, all of which were ultimately co-opted as uniquely Western knowledge. But I had three other goals in mind as well. First, to introduce some of the pioneers who left us stagnant and stultifying Europe, beginning in the 12th century, in the conviction that the Christian West had much to gain from the pursuit of Muslim learning. Second, to show that the Muslim world did not merely preserve classical wisdom from the Greeks, the Hindus, the Persians, and others, but they built upon earlier teachings to create a genuine Islamic science. And third, to highlight the Muslims' conceptual breakthrough, which goes to the heart of the Western experience, the realization that we humans have a right, even a duty, to explore and understand the world around us. In other words, to pursue a scientific understanding of the universe. Any abbreviated list of the achievements of Islamic science would surely include the introduction of algebra, breakthroughs in trigonometry, navigation, and cartography, a sophisticated theory of vision, the fundamentals of medicine, advanced astronomical models, and complex architectural design and construction techniques. Add to this an insightful reading of classical philosophy that would exert a profound influence on the development of Western thought, particularly in creating space for human inquiry within a religious worldview. Much of this had its roots in the ninth century, centered in the imperial Muslim capital, Baghdad, and its royal library, known as the House of Wisdom. Here, the ruling caliphs financed a remarkable flowering of scholarship that in time spread to centers such as Cairo and the cities of Central Asia, as well as to Muslim-controlled Sicily and Spain and contested territories in what is today Syria. And it was these latter locales that provided early access to the fruits of Arab learning for ambitious adventurers from Christian Europe. One such figure, known as Adelard of Bath, left behind a privileged existence in England and a dull education in France to the riches of Muslim learning. He returned years later with the geometric system of Euclid, a detailed table of the movements of the stars, early works of Arab astrology and astronomy, and an understanding of the astrolabe, which is an early analog computer that could track time and help establish geographic position, as well as a rare chemical text on way to dye leather tint glass, and produce green pigment, Adelard's favorite color. But Adelard's greatest legacy was not the introduction of any one text or any one technology, but his readiness to question the religious orthodoxy of Western society and to create space for human understanding of the world around us. Of course, God rules the universe, Adelard declared upon his return, but we may and should inquire into the natural world. The Arabs teach us that. The West's initial reception of Islamic learning was enthusiastic, setting off an intellectual arms race as lone scholars, princes, and potentates all competed for translation of Arabic texts that would help lay the foundation for the Renaissance. Sadly, this honeymoon was short-lived. Later generations of European scholars sought to bury all traces of Islamic influence. And so successful were these efforts that to this day, high school and college textbooks rarely acknowledge our intellectual debt to the Muslim world. Instead, preferring to draw an unbroken line from classical Greek and Roman learning to the present day. 
It is my hope that readers of the House of Wisdom will come away with an appreciation of the rightful place of Islam and the Muslims in the evolution of what we call Western culture.